This is a very high level overview of shelters and what to expect if you're expected to respond to a shelter. We are gonna follow this up with additional training for the environmental health staff. There is a training that is posted online already. It was done a couple of years ago, but it is still current. If you took that training and feel you're comfortable with it, there's no need to retake it. But if you want to review or if you've never had it, we'll make sure that we provide those links um, and that train course ID to you um, to take that course afterwards. For those of you that are nurses, we have a training that we're going to do in August. The date is still yet to be determined, but we will make sure we share that information with everybody. And that's going to be shelter training specific to nursing. And a lot of the more detailed information that's going to be pertinent to you will be in that class. So we have several speakers today, and each are going to introduce themselves when they um, either come up to the podium or come on the screen. Some will be here in the room with me, and some will be um, presenting from their remote location. And then we will have time at the end, hopefully, for questions. Um, but if we don't, we have an email address set up. You can put them in the chat if you're on the webinar. If not, you can email your questions to eprtraining at vdh.virginia.gov. That's E-P-R-T-R-A-I-N-I-N-G. And we will answer questions throughout um, today's training and afterwards at that email address, as well as during the training in the chat. So um, next slide, please, Adrenia. I'm just going to put the um, learning objectives up here for you to take a look at. And then um, while you're looking at those, Dr. Javeri is going to come up and do some opening remarks for us. Well, good morning, everybody. I want to start off by thanking all of you for giving us uh, some of your time to go through this very important training. Um, our work in public health was varied. Uh, we provide clinical services, population health services, environmental health services, and one of the most important things we do is in times of need, as we saw and heard a little bit on the forum, is respond to emergencies. Flooding in Buchanan County, fortunately, uh, we were able to respond along with the local officials in a manner that was expeditious, efficient, Certainly in larger type disasters, potentially hurricanes or other sorts of weather related activities, we may need to put up and assist with uh, sheltering of our residents. And an important role for public health is to really help uh, protect the surge capacity for hospitals. So if we can take care of individuals, we we'll just simply need electricity for the oxygen concentrator. If we simply need to provide somebody medications that otherwise may put them in a hospital day two, three, four, or a week after the event, that's where public health comes in. Um, and obviously, sheltering against the weather-related elements that people are not in the same place um, on a day-by-day -day basis. So the, the training you're going to get is very comprehensive. Um, received a lot of positive feedback last week. I know that many of our new staff particularly enjoyed hearing through um, OEP and many of our subject matter experts what they may be called upon to do. Um, as I shared last week, for those who are new, don't be overwhelmed. This is a very comprehensive training. Um, there will be many individuals working under the district leadership and along with OEP to ensure that our uh, response is coordinated and that you as an individual are placed in a, uh, in, in a, in a situation where you're able to adequately respond. So um, as with any emergency, the first thing to do is have situational awareness. What we, you know, we ask of you to do, what kinds of things you may need, um, and again, what kinds of trainings can really help prepare you for that effort. So a quick thanks to all of you. My thanks again to the Office of Emergency Preparedness and all of the folks who spent um, hours and hours in ensuring this training is, um, is useful to you um, and can be shared with you in a, in a fairly short amount of time. So again, thank you all. Thank you very much. And Adrenia, we can move to the next slide. Um, one more. This um, next one is just a picture of a shelter and then I am going to turn it over to Michelle Pope with the Department of Social Services. They are the lead agency in sheltering in Virginia, and she is going to um, give us a pretty comprehensive overview of shelters. Michelle, over to you. Good morning. Um, it's so great to be here and to be able to represent 
um, the Virginia Department of Social Services today. I am with the Virginia Department of Social Services Office of Emergency Management. We are a mighty team of six that handles the mass care in the Commonwealth and we support emergency support function six during disasters. Um, in addition, we have also been the, given the dubious job of being the lead agency for state shelters in the Commonwealth. Um, and so that's kind of a little bit about what we're gonna be talking about today. I know that doesn't directly um, correlate to local sheltering, um, but it also gives you a good idea of some of the things that you'll hear of regularly when it comes to sheltering. Um, one of the things that I think we address um, on a regular basis, and, and I think folks kind of get um, maybe a little turned off on, is that um, the picture that you see in front of you is, you know, what, what's a shelter? Um, a lot of people want to think that shelters um, take care of everything and everybody, and, and we do try that our best. But a shelter is, 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 a, is a life raft, not a cruise ship. Um, we, are, we, are, do not, we are not the love boat. We do not have somebody that is going to be um, trying to make sure that every single want and need of every person there is available, but we are going to make sure that those critical wants and needs are taken care of. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that as we go through. So next slide, please. So um, all sheltering begins locally. Um, a great example of that uh, Dr. Jaberry just spoke about is the flooding in Buchanan. Um, sheltering starts locally and a lot of times it ends locally. Um, it's a, the advantage of that locality and its residents to stay as close to their original homes as possible. Um, that allows uh, individuals to access their normal routines, their jobs, their schools, and their daily support systems um, far more easily than having to leave. If a locality can't shelter within itself, the best option next is to go into what's considered host sheltering. And that's having a nearby locality provide through an agreement with the evacuating locality to shelter for that evacuating locality's residents. Um, that's sometimes done through prearranged agreements that are made in blue sky. So a, an a, a, um, agreement made during the good weather or it can be done in just in time through the use of statewide mutual aid. But if and only if it's determined necessary, um, the state will open state coordinated regional shelters. They do not support, they support, they do not supplant local shelters. So we do not open instead of, we open on top of. Um, so state coordinated coordinated regional shelters, I'm going to continue to refer to them as state shelters because state coordinated regional shelters is a mouthful. So when I talk about state shelters, that is what I'm talking about. State shelters are only opened by the governor. He's the only person that has that ability. Um, and they are open for large scale or catastrophic events where data shows that local shelters are or are anticipated to exceed their capacities and they are opened outside of the impact area, not in interior too. Next slide. State shelters, just like local shelters, only work because of great coordination and cooperation of multiple agencies. Each brings a specific skill and expertise to the table that's critical for the success of the shelter. BDSS social services at the state level is the lead for state shelters and coordinates the activation and operation of those shelters and this and provides the management and general population support staff. VDH, you guys, coordinates medical and environmental epidemiological staffing and support. Behavioral health brings behavioral health experts. Ag and Consumer Services coordinates and staffs associated pet shelters on any of our state sh shelter sites and assists in their directing individuals with pets at non-pet shelter sites. Um, state police coordinates the provision of safety and security personnel on site. Emergency management pr provides access and functional needs coordination. and. VITA makes sure that we have connectivity and support for any of our on-site technology. It takes a team to make a shelter work, both at the local and at the state level. Next slide. 
as a staff member for any of these agencies, or if there, you are part of the adjunct emergency workforce, which maybe you have heard about or have not heard about, any of those folks that are assigned to support state shelters or any local shelter must be personally prepared for disaster response. You need to be accountable to yourself. You need to know what your role is in the shelter and be trained appropriately. You need to be accountable to your family. You need to have a plan in place to make sure your family's cared for when you're deployed. You will not be successful when you are working and in the shelter environment if you're worried about your family back at home. Be accountable to the shelter itself. Make sure that you respond on time. Check in as you're supposed to. Check out as you're supposed to. And know what your role is and make sure you know the roles of others in your shelter so that you can seek assistance when necessary. Next slide. So when it comes to sheltering, some things are overarching areas in, when it, in across all the areas and expertise when it comes to state shelters. Um, there is specific shelter guidance that we've created for state shelters to that has been incorporated into our state shelter plan to help provide a more safe and secure shelter. These are policy or protocol for our state shelters, our SCRS, um, unless they're expressly listed as legislation. And you're gonna see quite a few that are listed as le legislation as we go through these slides. Although we use these and they are listed in our state shelter plan, they may not directly translate to local shelters. Next slide. So state shelters, nor any shelter, should discriminate or limit entry to any person or persons. State shelters also do not segregate populations except for those with immediate health or safety concerns. We have two different, we have a state code that states that conduct that violates any Virginia or federal statute or regulation governing discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, pregnancy, childbirth, or unrelated medical conditions, age, marital status, or disability shall be unlaw unlawful discriminatory practice. So not only do we have the reality of what we have in our plan, but we also have code that backs that up as well as executive order number one that prohibits discrimination based on those same things as listed in code. Next slide. Additionally, <clears throat> any person or persons that are deployed to support state shelters or any shelter are covered under Virginia code section 44. I'm not even gonna get into the others, you can read it. Which, produce, which provides protection to individuals, groups, entities, and sites, except in case of gross ne negligence or willful misconduct when providing response and recovery services and disasters. We know that this is something that comes up every time we have um, any kind of exercise or event in regards to worrying about the liability. And it, in this case, because it is a disaster situation, we do have code that specifically provides coverage for those folks that are going to be providing disaster services, barring those two specific situations, gross negligence or willful misconduct. Next slide. State shelters don't allow weapons into any of its facilities. Um, safety, of course, is our top priority and shelter security as well as management are gonna take whatever actions are necessary to ensure the safety and of the staff and the residents within the shelter. As you can see here listed are a couple of Virginia code sections that specifically address the pro prohibition of weapons in shelters. Um, Remember that shelters are public spaces. <clears throat> Shelter residents are responsible for safeguarding their own belongings and registered sex offenders will not be segregated from the population. So as folks are entering into the shelter, at least for state shelters, they will be given some information as they walk in that are kind of the rules and regulations. And two of the things that we will tell them are these two things. Now we will not specifically say we don't 
segregating registered sex offenders. But we will specifically state, hey, this is a public space. You need to make sure you're taking care of your own stuff and your own people. And by the way, remember, you don't know everybody here in the shelter. <clears throat> so make sure that you protect yourself as if you would if you were in any other public space, whether you're going to the mall or whatever. Make sure that you keep up with your kids, keep up with your stuff, um, because you don't know who your neighbor is. Next slide. In addition to no weapons, um, we will not allow alcoholic beverages or illegal drugs within our state shelters. Um, and we will also not allow smoking or vaping within any of the shelters. There will be designated smoking areas to the exterior of the state shelters. Um, so this is not only something that is within our state facilities, um, a requirement within our state facilities, but on most of our campuses where we have state shelters, these are already rules in place and we just put these as an additional on top of um, as a rule for our state shelters, even though the rule is already in place in those facilities. <laughs> Next slide. So we all have a phone. Here's mine. We all have a phone. We all have tablets and computers and all those things. And every person that's going to come into our shelter will probably at least have a cell phone, if not more. And we all know how important that personal technology is to each of us. It's our way of remaining connected with family, friends, work, whatever. Um, so the state shelters aren't going to restrict the use of those pieces of technology. When we use technology in the shelter, though, we're going to kind of ask residents to exercise some courtesy and restraint when using them because they need to take into consideration the safety, security, and solitude of all the residents and the staff. So a few things that we're going to ask, and, and we have signs that put this um, out there, but putting their phones on silent or vibrate so that everyone's dings and buzzes and beeps and whatever sounds their phones make isn't happening all the time all places in the shelter. Um, we're asked folks to take calls outside of dormitory spaces. Um, we've all been in that situation where there's that person that's doing, you know, on a phone in that public space, having their conversation um, right next to you. We ask that people use either headphones or keep their speaker volumes low when using their phones. <laughs> and we also ask them to be mindful of the content on their device. There may be small children around you and what you're watching may not be appropriate for little eyes to oversee. Not that you're intending for them to oversee, but it may be. Um, and also picture taking. People just don't think about it. Everybody takes a selfie everywhere. Just It's, it's something that you do everywhere. But in a shelter environment, you may be taking a selfie of yourself and not realize there are five people behind you and maybe one of those people that's behind you is in a situation where they don't want their picture posted because they may not want to be seen or found. Um, so being cautious of photography while in the shelter. And then, of course, reminding folks that free Wi-Fi, particularly open free Wi-Fi, may not be the best option and has its own risks. So technology is a big issue in every shelter and everywhere you go. Next slide. So evacuees with prescribed medications and supplies are going to be asked to bring those along with them, as well as any necessary devices to help maintain their health while they're in the shelter. Um, when they have those, they're going to keep them with them while they're in the shelter. Now, if they need assistance in administering those medications or operating the, that equipment, they can request that through their on-site health representative or, or one of our VDH folks. Um, on-site health care providers may not always be able to help do that, whether it's they may not be able to administer those medications specifically, like things that have to be infused over a period of time, such as that. And in those situations, that individual may need to be referred to a nearby provider that can meet those patients' needs. <laughs> if the need is urgent, the client will be transported via the EMS system to a tertiary level facility for treatment. Next slide. 
Additionally, there may be shelter residents that come in that are currently receiving Suboxone, Methadone, or Subitex. Um, and, and they need to take that medication at the same time each day per their standard schedule. If, there is, if the operation of a local opioid treatment program is threatened or is by the impending inclement weather or natural or man-made disaster, the state opioid treatment authority may authorize dispensing of a multi-day supply of these medications to individuals in the program. Should these individuals subsequently present at a state shelter, their medication must be handled appropriately so that it's secure and available for their use every day. Next slide. And on top of that, disasters are rough on everybody and they can trigger or exacerbate behavioral health issues for both shelter residents and staff. Um, the stress of these events can cause individuals to act or respond in ways that are unintended or unexpected. Behavioral health representatives will assist with behavioral crisis stabilization as requested, appropriate, and available, um, especially in response to disruptive behavior. And we should make every attempt to de-escalate a situation, barring if someone is threatening to harm themselves or others, before removing that resident from the shelter. Next slide. So now we get into accessibility. Accessibility for us is super important. The shelter, the state shelter, and all of its services should be accessible or have equitable alternatives in place for all of those things. Everyone in the shelter should be able to, if able to before, independently access, understand, and use any communication, facilities, or services within the shelter. Next slide. So access and functional needs <clears throat> is kind of one of those things that we hear a lot but don't truly understand. And <clears throat> this graphic kind of gives a good depiction of, of just a a smattering and, and a big smattering of some of those folks that kind of fall into that descriptor. It's a large and varied group, but access and functional needs may require assistance for individuals as a result of a number of conditions, both temporary and permanent, that limit their ability to take actions or access services. Now, the here, there's no diagnosis or specific evaluation required to determine that an individual, individual has an access or functional need or multiple. Um, individuals with access and functional needs <clears throat> may include folks from diverse cultures, races, nations of origin, those who can't or don't read, those who have physical, sensory, behavioral, mental health, intellectual development, and cognitive disabilities. And as you can see, that's just a small smattering. It could be folks that are, who are experiencing homelessness, that, have, that are low on the economic scale, um, have lack of access to transportation. Um, children are considered individuals with access and functional needs as are adults. What this means, <clears throat> at least in my mind, is that that means that we have to take into consideration everyone and their needs and try our best because we're not gonna win every time, but try our best to meet those needs to the best of our abilities at every shelter. And we're gonna do that specifically. Next slide. In addition to the provision of services, it's critical that those supports that an individual brings with them to support themselves are not taken away. And I know that sounds crazy that something like that would, would ever happen, but it truly could happen in a shelter scenario, um, particularly those with service animals. Um, individuals cannot be separated from service animals. Their medical equipment, their supplies, their care providers, their interpreters, or family or unrelated household members that assist them in the provision of their care. Um, it's, a, it's important to remember that service animals are not just household pets. Um, they provide a very specific and life safety 
and maybe even life saving service to their handler. And they are permitted to accompany their owners, their handlers, anywhere the public is allowed in the shelter. And that means in the bathrooms, that means in the cafeteria and food service areas, service animals are allowed everywhere with that handler and that owner. Next slide. Um, individuals with access and functional needs will be able to fully participate and receive the benefits of all the emergency program services and activities, including planning, preparedness, training, and exercises related to the sheltering plan and program. So we, as VDSS, and all of the partners that participate in developing state shelter plan, the state shelter plan, try really hard to incorporate individuals or or groups that represent individuals with access and functional needs or disabilities into our planning and exercise and training process to ensure that we're covering those individuals and that they have the opportunity to give us feedback. Additionally, communication within regarding shelters and mass care programs. So when we're in the event and we're trying to communicate what's going on, we are gonna make sure that we can have equally effective communications for all individuals, including those with access and functional needs. And that can mean um, making sure our messages regarding sheltering and mass care goes out in a easy to understand English. Um, so, and or even in other languages, um, ensuring that we have um, uh, translators that are doing ASL during briefings so that they can see that also. Um, communication is key when it comes to helping our folks understanding what's available, available to them in and outside of the shelter before they get there. Next slide. And as stated throughout, to ensure the accessibility and integration, each of our shelters will have a emergency management provided access and functional needs coordinator to assist in the provision of accommodations. It's not easy to find out and understand all the accommodations that are available and necessary to meet specific needs. So a process was gonna be in place at our state shelters for requesting, providing, and ensuring reasonable accommodations for all activities um, are, are in place no recipient of those accommodations will be charged for any of those supports or services necessary to make the programs and facilities accessible. All right, I think that's it for me. Great, thank you very much, Michelle, for that wonderful overview. We're now gonna move into roles and we're gonna begin with Jonathan Kaiser. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jonathan Kaiser. I'm at the Office of Emergency Preparedness here at the Virginia Department of Health. I want to thank Michelle for her excellent presentation regarding roles and responsibilities of emergency support function six um, and our partners at the Department of Social Services. Um, so I'm going to kick off the portion of the training where we get a little more uh, into the weeds with what uh, the role of public health or emergency support function eight is in a shelter setting. Um, we'll go more in depth with each of these topics uh, with the subject matter experts as we progress through this training. Um, but in general, in both local and state coordinated shelters, um, primary services for BDH or local public health would include triage and first aid, health assessment, assistance with medication administration, and case management. Um, and with those services, our goal is really to help the residents maintain their current level of health while they're in the shelter setting. Um, other services that we provide in shelter settings include environmental health services, communicable disease prevention and control services, and WIC or nutrition services as needed. Um, I do want to point out one key word on this slide though, which is coordinating. Um, so we know that the local shelters look a little different in every locality. So sometimes the Red Cross is uh, heavily engaged in operation of those shelters, um, sometimes local EMS um, kind of takes the lead on the patient care piece. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because it does look a little bit different. Um, so it might, you know, vary by locality, even within a health district, um, which is totally fine as long as the keyword, again, coordinated ahead of time and pre-event. Um, so if we move to the next slide. 
This is an overview of Annex H, which is the mass care plan of each emergency response plan. So at this time, we do have one appendix. Um, you'll see it here. It's the interim guidance for disaster shelters during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that's something we've maintained for the past two years. Um, it's currently available for your review. Um, there are also various attachments associated with the plan. So the first one here is the Community Health Services Nursing Directive, um, which goes into scope of practice for um, our healthcare partners in the shelter setting. We also have uh, various forms that could be used at the local level, a medication record form, a health and medical intake form, uh, the environmental health form, um, and then a shelter bag checklist, as well as the last one here, which is the uh, authorization for disclosure of protected health information. Um, we move to the next slide, please. Um, so as far as local health district plans go, uh, we have a few pointers listed here for you. Um, you of course want to define the roles and responsibilities for specific staff and MRC volunteers that you might include um, in your shelter activation plans. Um, again, just making sure those local plans are current, they're updated uh, in collaboration with your emergency management and social services partners, you have necessary agreements in place, um, and that you've just worked ahead of time on coordinating and planning for um, who's providing those medical support services and what does that look like, uh, who's staffing the various positions, um, making sure you have the necessary supplies and equipment, um, and that the right public information is being released. Um, the last bullet here is just a reminder to not forget to collaborate with your community services boards and your EMS and other healthcare partners. Um, next slide, please. So other important things for your local plans to take into account, um, staffing ratios uh, based on the population of the mass care facility. Uh, we do have a template available in Annex H, uh, but we do understand that Really, it boils down to what, what the population looks like that shows up at your um, individual shelter. Um, so you'll have to be flexible and adjust as needed there. Um, to Michelle's earlier points about access and functional needs consideration, um, just making sure you're working with the shelter management team um, to address any of those issues. Um, and also working with the shelter management team to make sure you have the necessary space um, to do what you need to do in that. Um, shelter setting, um, specifically uh, isolation and quarantine areas um, that can take up quite some uh, uh, in-demand real estate within a shelter. So just making sure that those places are identified ahead of time. Uh, next slide, please. So plans are great, but training and exercises or exercising to them is even better. Um, so again, just making sure staff are familiar with their role uh, in the plan, how they'll be deployed. Uh, you're developing and maintaining local training uh, based on your individual plans. Uh, participate uh, as best you can in local sheltering exercises uh, at both the state level with um, the Department of Social Services or at the local level. Um, and then more specific training um, related to CPR and AED, um, revive or naloxone administration training. Um, and finally, just making sure that all of the great work you do is captured in your workforce development plan at the local health district level. Uh, that's all I have, and again, we'll move into some more um, specific content which has ex presenters. Thank you all. Next is Julie Hill. Hi, Perfect. Go ahead, Julie. Yep. Um, I'm Julie Henderson. I'm the director here at the Office of Environmental Health Services. And I'll be talking to you today about the role of the environmental health professional at shelter. So district environmental health um, personnel play an important role in ensuring the public is protected while accessing shelter resources. They may be tasked with inspecting shelter facilities prior to activation of the shelter to ensure any applicable regulations are met to assess the safety of food and water supplies and the appropriate disposal of solid waste and wastewater. But typically the EH role is filled by an environmental health specialist within the district, and they should demonstrate an understanding of environmental rules and regulations as they pertain to mass care facilities. EH reports to the district health director or designee, and they're not required to be on site at the shelter at all times. Next slide, please. 
The EH roles during emergencies at shelters address the building environment to include monitoring food and water safety and sanitation, the proper disposal of waste and effective pest management, as well as to provide general shelter support. In addition, they should provide guidance and support relating to rabies prevention in pet shelters. Food safety is often the main focus, though, for environmental health at the shelter. EHS are tasked with ensuring that food provided is from an approved source, is protected from spoilage and contamination, good hygiene practices are utilized by food handlers and shelter participants, and time temperature control measures are in place, including cold holding and hot holding of temperature control safety foods. And EHS's food safety goals are to reduce the risk of foodborne illness, intervene and ensure that corrective action is taken when food safety may be compromised, work with the food service operator to provide safe food, and to educate the public and shelter volunteers about food safety practices before, during, and after an emergency or disaster. Special considerations are of course required in shelter operations. Foods often prepared for large numbers of responders and the affected public, and the food is prepared in a variety of locations at times. Next slide. There are several resources available for environmental health. The VDH mass care plan that Jonathan referred to earlier that includes the environmental health shelter assessment form. This form is also um, provided in the train course, VDH Environmental Health and Shelters. Um, and Susie mentioned that earlier. Uh, this course really walks the environmental health specialist through that EHS assessment form. And it was adopted from the CDC's interim general population shelter guidance. There's also an additional resource that EH may use, and that's the Association of Food and Drug Official, or AFDOS, Food Emergency Regulator Pocket Guide. It's really an excellent resource for environmental health specialists responding to emergencies. It's not limited to shelters, um, and this resource is available on the AFDO website for free as a download. That's the end of my presentation, Susie. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to the role of epidemiologists. Jonathan Polk, are you on? I am. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to speak briefly on the role of epidemiology. Uh, often these uh, individuals will serve as more of a surveillance officer reporting to the, the health and medical branch director within the ICS uh, organization for these shelters. Ultimately, our goal is to conduct surveillance and um, assist with disease control within the populations at the, the mass care facilities. Individuals in this role will generally be part of a, an epidemiology or communicable disease team, an epidemiologist or a public health nurse uh, that has the, the, the knowledge of disease surveillance and investigation. Um, this position also is, is not uh, required to be on site at all times. Often with uh, these types of situations, they will be uh, involved in uh, surveillance activities throughout the, the district or affected region, as well as potentially um, at the different uh, shelter sites within their, their area. Although um, they, may, they may be on site to respond to any kind of events that are occurring at the shelter that do need to be investigated. <clears throat> Some of the main responsibilities for this position would include developing a standardized interview, interview tool or data collection process for the surveillance investigation of disease conditions of epidemiologic significance, monitoring the health status uh, of residents within the shelter, as well as identifying occurrences of communicable diseases. They may make recommendations for uh, disease prevention and intervention strategies, as well as uh, prophylaxis for individuals and they will coordinate with facility personnel on those types of prevention strategies and control measures. There is a, and I believe uh, Jonathan Kaiser did show this on the list there as part of the materials, there is a verbal triage questionnaire form that is typically recommended to initially screen individuals as they come into the shelter. Some very basic questions in terms of like, do they feel well today? Have they recently been sick? Have they had fever, cough, sore throat, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea within the last 24 hours? Do they have any, uh, currently have or have they had any rashes recently? 
And all that allows for um, the triaging and additional infection prevention activities for those individuals if they are identified. And I believe there are um, more details for uh, triaging uh, within the plant itself. Next slide. Born out of the COVID-19 response, our regional epidemiology teams now also have regional infection preventionists. So they, according with the regional epis, as well as uh, shelter nursing staff, they do provide infection prevention and control expertise and are available for consultation, depending on the nature of any sort of suspected disease uh, conditions or transmissions that may be occurring within the shelter. Next slide. The, the ultimate goal, uh, as we look at the, the regional infection preventionists and then uh, for surveillance and investigation in general, uh, uh, is to make sure that we are providing access to safe shelters during a disaster and that individuals should not be denied access uh, to a shelter simply based on the presence of an infectious disease or illness. Uh, there, there are multiple different uh, aspects or, or steps through this process. We already talked about screening there on the left in terms of trying to screen individuals as they come in and then either when they come in or at some point during their time in, in the shelter, if they do develop some sort of um, identifiable illness, we have the ability to uh, look at physical distancing or uh, identifying isolation areas, as well as uh, continuing to monitor uh, those individuals or potential close contacts of those individuals, work on communicating between um, the shelter, the surveillance officer, the regional infection preventionists, and potentially uh, local hospitals, depending on the nature of, of the disease and, and how they are progressing. And then, of course, coordinating with testing and you know whether or not we're going to be doing something like that. If we're looking at like an outbreak situation, potentially coordinating uh, testing through DCLS or uh, potentially through other uh, local providers and, and laboratories. I believe those are my slides. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on and look at the role of the clinician and the nurse. Um, Holly, are you on? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go right ahead. Good morning, everyone. My name is Holly Balderson, and I'm the nurse manager for beautiful Three Rivers Health District. I will be providing a very brief overview of the role of the clinician and nurses in shelters. The clinician or health services unit leader is usually the local district health or medical director. They would oversee all health and medical services at the shelter, and this can be done in person or virtually. They would supervise the health and medical staff at the shelter and will coordinate with the shelter leadership to provide health services to those residents in the shelter, such as assisting in coordinating care when residents are identified as needing a higher level of care than what the shelter can offer um, or assisting with providing orders for medications or medical supplies and or equipment that a resident may need. The clinician is not required to be on site at all times, uh, but they must be available for consultation by phone or telehealth at all times. They must have a current license as a medical doctor, doctor of osteopathy or nurse practitioner. Next slide, please. Moving on to the role of the nurse, uh, nurses in shelters will have a registered nurse that will oversee them uh, to ensure that they are performing duties within the scope of their care. They must have a current uh, CPR, VLS, AED certification. Uh, nurses, nursing services um, would include triage, which would be performed on all residents entering the shelter to determine their level of need. Uh, there's a health medical intake form that will be used to assess the resident's general appearance, health history, vital signs, including blood pressures and temperatures, allergies, current medications, and the need for medical supplies and or equipment. They will be looking for any signs of possible conditions that would warrant transferring them to a higher level of care or placing someone in isolation. First aid may include things such as care of minor wounds, hypoglycemic emergencies, aspirin for chest pain, um, and or delivery of Narcan if needed. Health assessment and screening. These are ongoing assessments to ensure the safety and well-being of the shelter residents. 
monitoring for changes in health conditions and possible communicable disease outbreaks, uh, ensuring residents have blankets when it's cold, water when it's hot, et cetera. Uh, they may also perform limited medication administration. Um, this could be things such as assisting a resident with opening medication bottles or packages, reading directions on bottles, assisting with self-administration of medications and ensuring that they have the medications they need or obtaining orders from the clinician uh, for what may be needed. Case management uh, is where the nurse would work with the agencies to obtain those medical supplies and equipment, replace oxygen tanks, uh, coordinating dialysis treatments, assisting with ADLs such as setting up for meals or bath, helping residents ambulate or, or get to a toilet, um, while working to get other care into place for them. Um, and this may also include identifying a need for behavioral health services. Um, as I said earlier, this was a very brief overview of these roles and more in-depth training specifically for nurses will be provided sometime in August. And Susie, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you. Um, so you mentioned um, behavioral health and we're gonna hear from one of our partners now with the Department of Behavioral Health and Deve Developmental Services, Craig? Yes, Susie, confirm you can hear me? Yes, we can, go right ahead. Please introduce yourself first. Uh, sure, my name's Craig Kamage. I'm the Director of uh, Enterprise Management Services for the Virginia Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services and, um, and the Disaster Behavioral Health Coordination uh, rolls up under my Disaster Behavioral Health Coordinator, Stephanie Waite, and then ultimately uh, to me as the, the Head of Emergency Management at DVHDS. Uh, so with regard to shelter support, it's, it, we have to draw an important distinction between what we think of as clinical behavioral health services and then disaster behavioral health services. Disaster behavioral health services, those services primarily offered in shelters and other disaster scenarios, are simply about uh, trying to help individuals who are potentially going through the, the worst day of their life uh, cope with uh, uh, you know their their new situation. It is about adaptive functioning, um, connecting them with uh, services that may be able to help them, an, an awful lot of listening uh, and understanding, and assisting them with meeting their uh, their direct and basic needs. And so we do this inside shelters uh, through full coordination with. Uh, Virginia's Community Services Boards. Uh, Virginia's uh, CSBs, as we call them for short, there are 40 CSBs across Virginia. They cover every inch of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and they are fantastic organizations uh, that are the portal of entry for the public uh, mental and behavioral health system, as well as the developmental disability system in Virginia. Uh, in, the, in the case of a state shelter, uh, we coordinate directly with the CSB in the location where the state shelter is to be set up uh, to be the primary deliverer of disaster behavioral health services within that shelter. Of course, in the in the case of local shelters, each locality has its own CSB, and uh, and they are there are uh, across the Commonwealth pretty strong relationships between local emergency apparatus and uh, the community services board. A DBHDS does not have. A, a cadre of uh, disaster behavioral health staff that deploy throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, we, we partner with the local units, the community services boards, to provide that support. In the event that uh, one community service board cannot, all right, in the event that one community services board cannot meet the need on the ground, DBHDS will then coordinate mutual aid from surrounding community services boards to ensure that the shelter's needs are met. And then finally, uh, DBHDS also does uh, build and curate a disaster behavioral health team of volunteers. Disaster behavioral health services do not need to be delivered by uh, any licensed or certified staff. They are services that can be delivered by uh, trained uh, lay individuals and disaster responders. And so we, uh, we are all the time building our disaster behavioral health team uh, from the volunteer level, and this team uh, would potentially become involved in a, uh, in a state level uh, or local disaster response if both the local CSB and our ability to draw upon CSB mutual aid were exhausted. Uh, if you'd like more information about disaster behavioral health services in general uh, or how we offer them in services, I'll drop a link in the chat here. 
um, that will also give you information about uh, our, our state disaster behavioral health team, uh, a link over to psychological first aid, uh, which is a, a course online that you can use to expand your knowledge of behavioral health support services. Um, and Susie, I think that pretty much covers how uh, disaster behavioral health works in a shelter. Great, thank you so much for joining us and for the information. So now we're gonna move back to BDH and hear about our Medical Reserve Corps. Laura, are you on? I am, Susie, thank you. Um, my Great. name is Laura Tash and I am the Medical uh, MRC Program Administrator covering for Mike Magner, uh, who is our State Volunteer Coordinator. Uh, quickly gonna give you an overview of uh, the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps and how they can support during sheltering situations. Uh, the Virginia Medical Reserve Corps is the volunteer program for the Virginia Department of Health. Our Medical Reserve Corps volunteers are an excellent source of, of public health and general support staffing. All deployable MRC volunteers have undergone a level one state police background check and all medical credentials are verified using the Virginia Volunteer Health System, which links to the Department of Health Professions. DHP database. Our volunteers can serve in a variety of roles in an emergency shelter, including, but not limited to, clinician, nurse, triage, medical support, and admin support roles. If needed, our level one MRC volunteers can serve as team leaders at shelters. MRC volunteers can be deployed locally by our MRC unit coordinators, regionally by MRC regional coordinators, or statewide by the Virginia MRC state team. Any support roles requested should match the local or state shelter plan requirements. And when using volunteers for support, the plan of multiple shifts or consider shift lengths, four to eight hours, 12 hours, et cetera. Our volunteers are more likely to fill the shorter shifts. As staff members support longer shifts, the use of volunteers can provide respite support to staff members. If any unique needs arise, communicate with MRC team and we are certain we can find a way to assist. Thank you, Susie. Great, thanks. Now it's gonna go over to Sue Skidmore who will introduce herself and she's gonna to talk to us a little bit about deployments. Hi, thank you, Susie. I am Sue Skidmore with the Office of Emergency Preparedness and for the purposes of this, um, presentation, I think it's helpful to know that I was a local health emergency coordinator who deployed staff out of state for an interstate deployment during Hurricane Florence. Um, so there's three types, local, intrastate, and interstate, and up until now we've talked a lot, a lot about the intrastate and how um, that works as well as local. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the interstate. Um, next slide, please. So when you um, receive a request um, or are getting ready to send a request, you will be working with the Office um, of Emergency Preparedness here at the state. Um, there will be a request that will come in asking for all of this type of information that you see on the screen and um, do your best to fill it out and know that it will change. Next slide, please. So, your staff that will be deploying will be told when and where to report, what the dates and duration of the assignments are, expected roles and duties, what to bring, what the anticipated working conditions and safety conditions are. Um, they may or may not get the local contact person until they get to the staging area prior to their arrival at the shelter. Um, and then they'll be told if, they are, if there are any overnight accommodations provided. Um, and again, I'm caveating all of this to you with the um, statement that this can all change. You're going to be told it up front and then it will likely change. If you don't get the information you're looking for, ask. If you have someone in your um, health department or somewhere else that you know that has worked with Peace Corps or a similar organization, hit them up for their experiences and their advice. It will be helpful. Next slide, please. So what to expect in deployment. Um, when we say austere conditions, we mean it. Um, you really need to do a lot of self-reflection to make sure that you're the right person for the deployment at hand. 
once you leave the state, it's very difficult to bring you back out of rotation. Um, you may, you will you likely be deployed into an active disaster emergency scene. You don't have any control over your shifts. Sometimes you may, but generally you won't. Um, your lodging is going to be maybe not what you like. You might be sleeping in a large room with other people who you don't know yet or ever know. <laughs> Um, you will be gone from your family with large chunks of time where you will have communication gaps. Um, you will, cannot rely on having internet services in those facilities. Um, I'm going to encourage you to document your day-to-day, -day, kind of the outline of your days. Um, it may come in helpful when you go back to do your um, timesheet or when you go to do your expense report. Um, we'll talk a little bit about working within the assignment scope and when you can, we will be talking about self-care. Um, this working within the scope of the assignment is a little tricky if you're a public health nurse and we'll talk about that a little bit more um, I'm going to stress the hurry up and wait um, what you're told you will be doing may be very different than what you are actually doing when you arrive um, and if you are a flexible problem solver who likes to meet new people and take on new um, challenges then this is probably the assignment for you as long as you can handle the austere conditions and the changing um, next slide, please. So a little picture of our um, deployment. This was Hurricane Florence down in the North Carolina area. This is a community impacted by the storm. Arrival with still high water. Um, travel with fish on the roadways. Um, this was inland from the rivers. Um, you may be told to turn right at this intersection and it may be flooded and you can't um, go on. So you'll have to have, um, I highly encourage you if you are deployed into a flooded area to take a paper map with you um, because you may not have internet service for your GPS. Um, bottom right is the logistics staging area. You may not know it, but you may be the one handling initial donations into the shelter. On the bottom left is the pet shelter, which was also part of where um, they did um, sort of the administration side of the, sh the shelter. So if you're allergic to animals, um, you need to think about that because you may very well be bunking with them. Um, and uh, next slide, please. I think the biggest decision um, is should you go and understanding whether you'll be helpful in this situation. Uh, if there's any chance that you might need to come home, that you might not be able to function in, a, in an environment like this, then perhaps you would be better staying back and supporting the mission by taking over someone else's um, core responsibilities. Um, but definitely ask. Um, if they're asking for nurses but you haven't clinically practiced, it might not be right. If you are not comfortable um, flexing around a role, um, then it does not be right for you. You need to be willing and able to sort of pitch in where the work is needed. Um, and I want to spend a minute of talking about um, if the deployment is for one to two weeks and you get to where you're going and you just can't, um, can't do it. I have to tell you, it's very hard to extract somebody or a team prior to the rotation ending. So really consider that. We had um, several situations where we almost tried to extract our folks, but um, they soldiered on and they made the best of it and they got home safely. Um, but just know there's going to be emotional challenges. It will have an impact on your family. The, your family may not be able to call you and reach you. They may not be able to text you and get a response. Um, you really need to take care of all of that and be able to walk away from it for the entire period of time. And also, if you have, um, if you prepare Please prepare your family and your responsibilities for at least a week longer than you anticipate going, just in case. Um, next slide, please. So, if you're deployed, remember you're part of the team. Um, if you go, if you, when you get assigned a group of people to go on to your final destination with, um, really spend your time getting to know each other and figure out who is probably your best team leader, and then sort of fall in line and follow your mini incident command system within that group um, and let that team leader speak for you guys. Um, it will streamline um, the communication. Use all of your resources, ask your questions. Um, when you get there, you may be re, um, coming in behind Red Cross. Um, just make sure that if there are challenges, you document them. 
um, try to be someone who's problem solving rather than identifying a concern and not having a solution for it. Um, if you can, take a little note, uh, notebook and um, mark your lessons learned, communi um, documenting communication challenges, and know that self-care can also be part of shelter responsibilities. So the bottom right picture is a person um, walking the dogs, which to them was the self-care that they needed. They didn't have to have any additional downtime in order to do self-care. Um, so next slide, please. All right, so we've talked a little bit about this stuff. Just make sure that you've arranged your, the care for your loved ones and your pets, handle your bills and your other financial matters. Um, if you're in the middle of something super big like closing on a real estate transaction, this might not be the best time for you to deploy. Clear your personal calendar and appointments. Turf your workload um, according to your supervisor's um, guidance to other people so that you have coverage. Put your out of office message in your email. Make sure that you take with you emergency contact information so that you can um, reach your supervisor when it's not work hours. You need that out of office contact information to reach back. Um, and um, make sure that your district or your supervisor has your um, emergency contact information um, on your side. That whoever your next um, of kin will be while you're gone so that they can reach back if anything does happen. Um, and again, remember that you are going to be gone and out of pocket, out of the loop for whatever the period of time is that you've committed to. Next slide, please. A little bit about deployment items that you need. You're going to take all of your identification stuff. When it comes to your professional license, your driver's license, your insurance card, I recommend taking a photograph of those and not taking your paper copies or your, um, take your driver's license, of course, but your insurance cards and your license. Leave those at home, take pictures of them. Make sure you take the timesheet to use while you're gone. And if you didn't get that or you don't get that, just then take your notebook and make um, um, notes about what you're working each day. I mentioned the paper map already. Um, and again, a reminder that internet is not reliable, and so you cannot rely on texting and calling and that kind of stuff. Next slide, please. Um, if you're uh, going into an area that is hasn't really, you don't know what you're going into, so take your as much personal protective equipment as you can. Um, a starter thing, a hand sanitizer, some gloves if you have access to them. Make sure you bring closed toe closed toe shoes. Um, you may not you may want a second pair since it may be wet where you're going and wet shoes are uncomfortable. Um, if you prefer to work in scrubs, bring your own. And then if you have a stethoscope or a blood pressure cuff, um, please take those with you if you are willing to, because they're going to be a short supply. As I said before, make sure you have your supervisor contact information and whoever is in charge of your deployment, typically your local health emergency coordinator, and then your business manager if you feel like you're going to need to reach back um, about um, business manager related things like timesheets and expenses and that kind of stuff. Next slide, please. On the personal side, um, bring sleeping items. We had people who took um, air mattresses, and that worked out fine. Um, sleeping bags, that worked out fine. Um, pillows, whatever makes you comfortable and gets you right to sleep. You might want to consider um, masks, sleep masks for your eyes so that you can make it dark when you need to sleep because it may be daylight when you're given time off. Please note the bottom left picture. Um, that person was lucky enough to have a little table next to their cot. Look how low the cots are to the ground. They're hard to get out of, even for people who are very mobile. Um, you don't have a lot of space. You may need an inner cot with no space. Um, take your chargers. Take flashlights with extra batteries. Take a raincoat for sure. Um, take your snacks um, and then and your medication. And then with regard to kids' activities and border busters, um, it is likely that you may need to help um, distract the children. So. Um, if you have something that you're willing to get rid of, some cards, some books, whatever, um, that will come in handy until the donations roll in. Next slide, please. Done. would also mention insect repellent, sunscreen, and many first aid kits on that previous one. Respond to health and safety, Scott? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Scott Shahan. I'm the Occupational Health and Safety Manager for Virginia Department of Health. Um, as you heard on previous slides, safety is the top priority for the shelters. Personally, it should be every day in the workplace, um, but this training is focused on the shelters. So you already heard it in earlier slides from earlier folks. Uh, should you go? That needs to be a consideration because that plays directly into your health and safety in the workplace. Uh, make sure the training and health status, all those good things are up to date. The PPE that's identified, please make sure it's appropriate for the shelter you're going to and appropriate for the hazards you may be exposed to, not just a standard PPE kit. And any personal items you take, uh, make sure they're appropriate for the shelter you're going to. Don't take excessive amounts, that's a security issue. But things like your own meds and all those types of things, make sure it's appropriate and that you uh, secure it properly. Uh, on the slide, you see some categories, some specific safety items uh, to think about. When they establish a shelter, they go through some checklists to make sure that it starts out in a safe and healthy format. But once the plan begins to evolve as you start bringing in clients and everything else, uh, we all know that the plans are great and preparedness is wonderful, but as soon as you implement a plan, changes start and things happen. Uh, so look out, uh, slips, trips, and falls. The reason it's important in there, uh, the environment's different than what you normally work in. Uh, excessive items may be brought in, things that we're running around, extension cords, all that good stuff. So just be careful. That's the number one, uh, or excuse me, number two cause of injuries for all state employees across the board, not just in a shelter environment. Uh, you heard talking about driving and commuting safety. Uh, just be careful, your mind may be on something else. Musculoskeletal injuries, that's the things like lifting, carrying, toting, uh, don't overdo, team lift. Uh, that's the number one injury for all state employees across the board, so just be careful. Additional sharp objects, and this goes not just needle sticks. Anything that's sharp and contaminated and can, and can cut you and uh, inject you with anything uh, is a sharp. It doesn't have to be a needle, so just remember to watch for that stuff. In animal insect bites, stings, uh, always a, a big concern in an unknown environment. Heat and cold stress, you know from your first aid environments that it doesn't have to be freezing or below for you to suffer cold stress injuries. And it doesn't have to be, as we're going through right now, hot environments, extremely humid environments for you to have a heat stress. So remember, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate when you're in those hot environments. Fire hazards specifically, what we're introducing into an environment uh, there is no smoking, no vaping, those types of things, but fire hazards are always present. Uh, make sure we, we check on those. Electrical hazards, extension cords, it's an unknown environment. Make sure we're using things correctly, uh, not overusing, not daisy chaining, all that kind of stuff. Just because it's an emergency doesn't mean we do things unsafely. Generators, if the place is operating generators, make sure that they're well ventilated or people going into that area. Monitor closely. CO stands for carbon monoxide. We've had people already hurt this year because of things like that and workplace violence everybody's under stress so really focus on um, de-escalation techniques watch for those environments that encompasses a whole lot from the health perspective biological and chemical exposures uh, disease and infection control you all do a wonderful job in the clinical side from that but this needs to be heightened when you're in a shelter environment bloodborne pathogens Food and water contamination, uh, EHS covered that as far as what the shelters providing. But remember, if you bring your snacks, your items, your things, make sure that good food safety is practiced with your personal items. Make sure that the stuff that needs to stay cold stays cold and you're not hurting yourself with your own food. Uh, you've heard about self-care. Sleep rest cycle is going to be disrupted. So just be aware of that. Traumatic stress ties in with things like sleep rest cycle, workplace violence, all those other de-escalation pieces, and self-care. And if you have pre-existing conditions, please, please, please uh, take those into account when you go through these, should I go, and am I capable, and then monitor yourself. Make sure uh, not to, to give out personal health information to people around you know what's going on. Uh, and post-deployment, the shelter response does not end just when you get in the car to go home downtime, get your head back straight, come back to work, relax, more self-care, and get ready to go. Um, and last time there were some questions about how injuries, uh, sharp injuries, tied into things. Uh, so needle sticks, yes, we need to track those.
and some of that ties into the next speaker. Um, Hillary's going to come up and talk to you about things HR related to the shelter. I am one of the deputy directors in the Office of Human Resources. I'm here to talk to you a little bit about some administrative items today. Excuse me. Um, the first item I want to um, touch on is emergency disaster leave. In the event where a disaster has been officially declared by the President of the United States or there's a state emergency declared by the governor of any state, we do have a policy that authorizes up to 80 hours, our agency head to provide up to 80 hours of emergency disaster leave. I do you want to caveat this to say that, oh, sorry, next slide, please. There we go. I do want to caveat this to say that some of our EWPs do have emergency functions in your job description. If that is a function of your job, this may not apply in that case. Um, if you have any questions when it comes time to an emergency disaster about this lead type of lead, Please contact your HR professional. We can talk you through it. Um, in the event of a disaster, we often have to, have to work some overtime. In the event that you do, you're going to want to fill out the HDP 43 disaster response labor record. Please know we have hyperlinked our current um, form right now, but this can change with each emergency event as they all do vary. Next slide, please. Hours of work, um, if your manager is able to do so, they do have the option of implementing a temporary adjustment to your work schedule to avoid <clears throat> accumulation of overtime hours. Um, if that is unavoidable, of course, please use the HDP 43 form reference in the last slide. Um, I do have all the policies that have information on um, work schedules and overtime hyperlinked below. We've got the DHRM emergency disaster leave policy that we talked about on the previous slide. Um, we also do have our internal policy, so please be sure you're referencing both. Um, and then the hours of work for both DHRM and BDH. And then we do also have an overtime and on-call compensation chart that is scenario-based, so it's a helpful tool to walk through in the event of an emergency. Next slide. As Scott said in his presentation, safety is our top priority, but we do understand that um, um, events do happen. If you do have a, situ a situation where there's been an injury, if it is an emergency, please do not hesitate. Please go ahead and get to the emergency room. Um, seek the emergency medical attention if the injury warrants such. Um, please make sure you're notifying your HR professional, your local HR professional, and um, us in the Office of Human Resources of any serious injury that does require hospitalization. And please make sure you're reporting the event to your HR um, HR contact the day the injury occurs. We have a pretty tight turnaround to get all the paperwork into um, MCI. You can see there it's 10 days, so we want to get that in as quickly as possible so we can support um, the claim. Um, if there is an injury that you need to um, report, please make sure you're filling out the accident investigation report, and also you're going to want to work with your HR professional to assure that um, you're choosing from a list of provi approved providers. For supervisors, you're going to make sure you're tracking the employee's leave as well. Um, and then if, there, if you have any additional questions, we do have a workers' comp supervisor's guide on the OHR internet, which I've got hyperlinked on the slide here. Next slide, please. We also understand that um, emergency events and emergency response can be um, very stressful. Um, events, so we do have some resources with the Employee Assistance Program. Um, we either have individual individual support or group setting support. Um, I've got two manuals that are listed at the bottom there. Um, you can for group setting report, please contact our office, Office of Human Resources, our benefits manager is Angel Miller, and she can help get that set up for you all. Um, but you, I do have both manuals there that kind of walk you through eligibility and the different types of um, sessions that they offer. For individual support, um, it is for employees that are covered by Anthem COBA um, and COBA HTHP and their dependents. That's at no additional cost. That is it for me, and I'm going to hand it over to Stacey Ferrer.
Good morning. My name is Stacey Ferreira. I'm the Director of Office of Financial Management. Um, just wanted to sh share some information regarding travel and employee reimbursements as when it comes to shelter training, um, shelter needs, not really training, that's what response. we're doing today. Shelter response. Thank you, Susie. Um, so, unfortunately, uh, the Department of Accounts does not provide us an immediate exception to anything that happens unusual. Uh, for any type of emergency response. So our standard travel and employee reimbursement policies and procedures apply. Um, so we still have to uh, utilize the travel authorization request form if there is out-of-state travel involved or a cost uh, exceeding $1,000. Um, and then the employee reimbursement voucher, or the ETER, uh, is the document that we will utilize to reimburse employees for travel and, um, and for any other, other reimbursements. So important things to note here, so if it falls out of policy, anything that we normally do, we have to get pre-approval from the Department of Accounts to do, um, to request an exception. Those exceptions come through my office um, uh, with documentation about our needs, uh, and the circumstances, uh, certainly need help with developing those needs and circumstances because I don't know them, uh, and so that I can share them with the Department of Accounts and uh, advocate on behalf of our employees to um, to have them reimbursed appropriately. I will say that things like pers the personal items, like your toiletries, um, your bedding, that kind of thing that you may carry with you to go to a shelter, um, those are at your own expense. Those are not reimbursable. So just keep that in mind. Those are personal item items, and, and you know there's there's probably going to be very little of any leeway from the Department of Accounts to pay for those items. Um, so the big thing to know here is that. Standard operating procedures apply, which you know now is what you're going to know for um, shelter response. Um, but again, if we have anything that falls outside of our normal parameter that we need to address, um, those exceptions need to come to um, to me, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll make requests to the Department of Council if appropriate. Um, there's one other thing I forgot what it was. Uh, also, um, something that also comes up in uh, shelter response is, is food and uh, whether or not food is provided or not. Uh, so uh, you're gonna wanna document whether or not there was meals available for, um, for you to par partake of uh, during those, those times where you're in the shelter uh, for the per diem uh, availability for that time as well. Uh, we have seen in the past uh, where one individual will say meal wasn't provided, another individual will say it was provided, uh, so we wanna have consistency uh in in those uh doc in that documentation and as we all know every single time we do something like this um it's different and so unfortunately it's not a one-size-fits-all and so uh we are here in the office of financial management to uh, help you uh in any way we can great thank you all oh, right we're gonna skip that slide I would just say, record your time. Yeah. Record your time. All right, so a little summary here, best laid plans. Before I hop into that, I want to um, plug EAP. Um, one of the things that our team found is that when they got back, there was a group of us encouraging EAP. They didn't think they needed it. We encouraged them to just try one session. They decided to go as a group. They raved. They didn't have any idea that the things they experienced were things that were normal in the case of an emergency response. So um, when you get back, if no one offers you EAP or reminds you about EAP, please take your group that you traveled with and get EAP to just have one session with you. It will really help. Um, and now, Semper Gumby. This is a takeoff on Semper Fi, the Marine Corps um, motto. And this, if you remember, you're of a certain age, Gumby is a very flexible cartoon character. So Semper Gumby, always flexible. That is the motto of all emergency response. Um, it is constant change, it's constant hurry up and wait. Um, what you do might be different than what you're assigned. I can't stress that enough. Um, our staff went down there um, and we had the role of the nurse and we knew what they were gonna do and in the end, Cots are too low. People that can't get that usually can take care of themselves couldn't get out of the cots. Um, you need to watch for that so that people are getting up and moving and they don't become more disabled. Um, be a problem solver. Um, be willing to step up and do what's needed. Um, it's extremely rewarding work, but it's challenging. 
it can be very hot and uncomfortable. Um, but I really encourage you all to um, attempt to go, I mean, to, to go and if it's for you. If it's not for you, then support the mission um, by doing something back at the office. Um, let's see. This is an opportunity to educate our public. Um, I just want to mention that um, because what you have is a, a group of people who could not get out of harm's way. People that had the resources to get out of the way are probably not in the shelter. This is where um, public health um, boots on the ground. You'll be able to do a lot of education. Um, and then the next slide, I just want to share a little bit more about the mission that our team went on. Top right or top left is one of our team members um, making calls, making calls, making calls, case management front and center, um, triaging people to get them out of the shelter as fast as possible, understanding when something was an emergency or something could wait, um, very much a case management situation. Top right, bottom left, these are the um, staging areas that our team traveled through and where they slept. Um, this was not what it looked like when they were at their shelter, um, but there is no privacy screens, it's loud, it's hot, um, and you need to be out for that if you're going to go. Um, bottom right was the hand washing area and the shower rooms right behind that. Um, again, not a very uh, private area. So I guess the other thing that I would mention is that you will be working with people from all the different state agencies. Um, it is a team effort. And in fact, what was surprising to our team was that the um, state's forest service was running incident command because they had the knowledge about the weather, the cresting rivers, the timeline of anticipated future flooding, road closures, impact on shelter locations, impact on travel, as well as search and rescue impacts on travel. It was it was impressive. So um, highly encourage everybody to, to be willing to consider it and also be willing to admit that it's not for you. And for those of you who go, thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Sue. Actually, thanks to all of our wonderful presenters. Uh, we got some great information today. Here are some resources and some name and email addresses of people that you can contact if you do have additional questions. Don't forget the email address I shared at the beginning, eprtraining at bdh.virginia.gov. You can always send questions there, and I can get it to the right person to address any concerns you have. And then the last thing I want to mention is today's slides. If you registered by yesterday, I emailed out the link to them. But um, that link, Adrina, if you could just go to the next, the last slide. Put that on it. There you go. Um, to get a copy of today's slides. So you'll have them. If you have coworkers that were not able to attend, we are recording the session and we'll post it and then we'll send the link out to the train course so anybody that missed it can, um, can then watch it on their own time. Thanks again for your participation and 